So, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, guten Tag, bonjour, <laughs> whichever language. Um, yes, yeah, so today we're going to speak about generative AI. And in particular, um, I'm a Java developer at heart um, by trade. And I, I was curious to see what I could be doing in Java uh, for generative AI because what we're seeing is lots of stuff in Python usually. And uh, I'm, I know a little bit of Python, but I'm a Java developer, so I'd like to do stuff uh, using my favorite language. So um, I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud. Um, I uh, focus on various aspects, serverless um, architecture, even during architecture, uh, but also machine learning and uh, for the past few months, uh, generative AI. Feel free to follow me uh, on Twitter, on Mastodon, on Blue Sky and elsewhere. And let's dive in. So I'd like to start with a few um, notions of vocabulary. So first of all, to set the stage, we're talking about artificial intelligence, more precisely of a sub uh, part of it, which is machine learning. There are different ways to do machine learning, unsupervised learning, supervised, etc. That's how machines, uh, software systems uh, learn from data. Uh, we've got deep learning, which is all those uh, machine learning systems which actually use deep neural networks, deep in the sense that there are tons of neurons layered in many, many, many uh, layers. And there are different algorithms for that. Uh, I, I won't dive too much into the details. And um, there's also data science. Data science uh, is all about uh, artificial intelligence intelligence, but there, there are other aspects to it, like, you know, how you clean the data, etc., which is not necessarily uh, um, ML algorithms uh, per se. So that's why I put the little green box a little bit outside as well. Uh, and then as we zoom in, uh, there's generative AI, again, with different uh, neural network architectures, um, like transformers. That's the one we're going to have a look at. But some of them are great for uh, image generation. So think uh, about things like DAL-E, Midjourney, Stable Diffusions, et cetera. Uh, but we also have uh, large language models which are based on the transformers architecture, um, which is a way, um, uh, well, well, we'll see that in the next slide. Uh, but it's all about handling um, text or potentially different uh, modalities as well. Uh, but today we're going to focus on this uh, um, purple or uh, violet uh, box here with large language models. Large language models, since we're dealing uh, mostly with text, it's also part of the uh, wider uh, area that we call natural language processing. And this new neural network architecture uh, was actually created and invented by Google uh, five to six years ago. And uh, out of this uh, approach, this architecture, Many refinements have seen uh, the light of day uh, across the years and which uh, allowed us to, to come up with those large language models. And why is there such a revolution uh, nowadays? And uh, why have we seen so many new large language models e um, you know, uh, be, be born? Uh, it's because the, the Transformers architecture, what's interesting with it is the fact that the way it's been designed allows computers with GPUs, et cetera, um, to actually uh, analyze lots of data in parallel very quickly, and also to be able to do inference, that is uh, providing a, an answer to your questions, uh, also in parallel much more quickly because of the new uh, architecture, which is much uh, better aligned with the uh, CPU, GPU architectures that we have today to do stuff in parallel. So we're, we've been able to train bigger models. And with bigger models, we also have uh, bigger or, or more capabilities that have emerged of that uh, training. So what are large language models? They are kind of black box systems, uh, which are based on this uh, neural network architecture called transformers. And the goal of those systems uh, is to recognize, predict, generate human language. OK, and uh, just to take a, an example uh, with the Palm model, which was the 
the model that we uh, that Google uh, launched a couple of years ago. Um, when we speak about models, we usually we mention two key metrics, parameters and tokens. So parameters uh, is actually equivalent to the number of neurons you have in the neural network uh, architecture. So when you see uh, 340 billion parameters, uh, that means that there are a bunch of neurons that keep bits of memory in a way uh, and that uh, remember what they've been trained on. And tokens, tokens are words or parts of words. Um, and it's actually the, 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 the number of words or parts of words on which a model has been trained. So when we see that Palm has been trained on uh, 3.6 trillions uh, of tokens, uh, that means that um, it has seen more, uh, let's say uh, roughly uh, 3 trillion words during its training. So it's read uh, pretty much all of uh, you know the internet and tons of books and you know tons of uh, content to be able to uh, better understand uh, the, the human language. And what's so special about transformers and this uh, neural network architecture is that it's uh, it's like a big uh, statistical machine in the sense that uh, it's able to understand the relationships between the tokens or, or, or the words. So, for example, um, let's say uh, um, in, in the case of homonyms, for example, let's say the word interest. Uh, interest, it could be I'm interested in uh, um, artificial intelligence, but it could be the word um, interest rates, like the, the bank's interest rates. So it's able to figure out that a word, even, even when there are homonyms, is related to the surrounding context. Uh, so, for example, if there's the, the bank word close, probably this is about interest rates rather than uh, I'm interested in a particular topic. So it uh, it has relationships and probabilities uh, between words. So when it's when you send it a query, a prompt, it's going to analyze what you send it, and then it's going to try to uh, autocomplete the rest depending on what you asked it. And it's able to do that because it knows the um, statistical relationships between the words, the, the, the concepts, etc. cetera. Um, what else? We also speak about fine tuning. We won't cover that in that presentation, but that's when you have a, a pre-trained model uh, or foundation model. You can also further train it with your own data. That's uh, one way to uh, further train and make the language learn about something else or something else or, or be more specialized in a particular area uh, or topics. For example, the PALM model, uh, there are variations of that model that are also trained on uh, medical research paper and such. Uh, it's called MedPALM. So it's able to answer questions about medical research. Uh, there's another one about security to analyze um, online threats, vulnerabilities, and things like that, because it's been trained on a corpus of data uh, and text and so on, uh, on on the topic of uh, security. So as I said, this new uh, neural network architecture, transformers, uh, allowed new models to be trained on bigger and bigger corpuses of data and with more and more neurons and layers of neurons. And nowadays, you've got really huge models that are available uh, and that are able to do lots of uh, interesting tasks. So with a small model, with a, a small number of parameters, maybe it's able to uh, do some question answering. But as the model grows bigger, maybe it's going to be able to do translation, summarization. And as it goes even bigger than this, the, the biggest models are even able to like understand jokes and, and things like that. And the more uh, data it has seen, the, the bigger uh, new, new layers of neurons it has, the more capabilities emerge uh, during the, the, the training. And that's why those large language models are uh, capable to do uh, lots of things uh, today. Um, just a few words as well about uh, what Google and Google Cloud provides and the, the latest news uh, we announced recently. Um, so Palm, that's the model we're interested in today that we're going to use with uh, Java. Uh, it's actually what powers 
Bard. Bard is the uh, uh, online uh, tool that you can use to uh, uh, interact with with Palm, basically. But it's also used in a product called Maker Suite, which is a, a tool which allows you to craft your own prompts, etc. It's it's more for tinkerers, and not necessarily for developers, enterprise developers, and such. But I, I'll show you uh, what it looks like. But Palm is part of the Google Cloud Vertex AI offering. Vertex AI is what uh, uh, collects all the machine learning products and services and APIs uh, within Google Cloud. Palm 2 is part of the model garden. Model garden is a kind of collection of all the models that are available uh, in the Vertex AI offering. So you'll see Cody, which is a Palm variation that's uh, trained on code. So you can ask it to do, you know, code completion. Uh, you can chat with it as well to do, uh, um, you know, uh, please explain me that piece of code and that kind of stuff. You've got also uh, image generation with the imaging model. But inside Model Garden, there are also plenty of uh, popular open source or open models. Um, like Llama 2, Cloud 2, Falcon, etc., And uh, I, I think we also announced um, Mistral, uh, a very powerful small uh, model. Uh, so you can use Palm, but there are also other models that are available. And in Vertex AI, there are many other things, like there's a vector database for doing uh, retrieval augmented generation, for example, or semantic search. Uh, you'll also find existing APIs for vision understanding, text-to-speech, and, and so on. And plenty of other things like uh, Jupyter Notebooks, pipelines to train your own models, and uh, customize uh, uh, on-the-shelves uh, models. But uh, I won't dive too much into uh, that. I'll focus really, again, on the purple-violet box. And recently, like a month, or two ago, uh, there was the Google Cloud Next conference where we announced the, the newer models that, are, that were available in Model Garden. We announced a bigger model uh, for Palm, uh, or at least uh, with a bigger context window, so we can give it even more information, can feed lots of uh, text and bigger um, articles, let's say, if you want to do summarization and such. Uh, improvements to the coding model, uh, higher quality images, uh, in the imaging generation. Synth ID, that's interesting as well. That's a way to uh, add a digital watermarking for images that are generated with AI. Uh, that's important, for example, to fight um, uh, fake news uh, that you can see on um, like social media and such. Uh, for example, maybe uh, you've seen like the the Pope wearing a, a big white uh, coat, a fluffy coat and everything that was generated, but with, um, so I don't know what they used to generate it, maybe mid journey or something else. Uh, but uh, with uh, watermarking, you'll be able to say, okay, this, is this image is fake. It's not a real image. So it's an interesting way to uh, fight um, misinformation and so on. And uh, yeah, many, many other things that were announced to uh, simplify semantic searching and that kind of stuff. So um, uh, I went quite quickly through this introduction because I really want to uh, spend time with you on some demos. Uh, so let's have a look at some demos. First, I'd like to show you uh, the Palm API um, in Bard, in Maker Suite, and then we'll also uh, have a look at the, uh, the demos that I've built. Um, and um, yeah, so let, let's start with that. There's uh, something that I find important to stress. It's the fact that and you've already you've already heard about this, but large language models um, they are great at understanding um, relationships between words and concepts and so on, but sometimes they hallucinate. Um, so it's important as you uh, integrate large language models in your application to think about ways to mitigate such things. Uh, hallucinations. And uh, one way to do that is to do uh, patterns like uh, ritual augmented generation, when you, where you ground your answers from a corpus of uh, text or, and data that you uh, manage yourself, uh, instead of letting the large language model uh, invent uh, stuff. There are other things to keep in mind, things like prompt injection, uh, because sometimes you can um, hijacked somehow the, the prompt that was uh, sent to the LLM 
So there are there are ways around this. I, I won't dive too much into this aspect, but I think it's stuff that's important to keep in mind as you develop uh, new models uh, or integrations with uh, with models. Uh, I'm going to show you first Maker Suite, which is the um, Tinkerer focused product to uh, play with um, the Palm API. So you can do different things like a chat prompt, a data prompt, if you want to do a few shots learning. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. And also text prompt. And uh, something I like to do is um, illustrate an, 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 an hallucination, basically. So for example, let's say, what's the name? So usually the, this works. Sometimes I have surprises depending on like the, the settings, the temperature and, so, and such. But uh, what's the name of the first cat that stepped on the moon. So I voluntarily ask the question in such a way that I'd like it to answer uh, with the name of a cat that actually stepped on the moon, right? And um, I'm going to type this. Uh, I'm going to hit run. And usually it answers something like Felicet. Felicet is the first cat who stepped on the moon. But what? There's no cat that went on the moon, right? So if instead you use uh, Bard, which has implemented lots of guardrails to prevent um, uh, hallucinations. Uh, let me copy that and uh, try the same query, which uses, in, in Bard, it's using the same Palm API, right? But you'll see that the answer uh, is slightly different. So let's say, what's the first na the, the name of the cat that stepped on the moon? And usually, it should not hallucinate this time, and it should tell you no cat ever uh, stepped on the moon. And actually, there's a cat called Felicet. Uh, it was a stray cat that was sent on a rocket, a French rocket, actually. I'm French, by the way. Uh, in 1963, um, the cat was sent in space, but it didn't, it didn't go uh, to the moon. And also, just to illustrate uh, about hallucination, how you can ensure that um, things that are generated by a large language model is more factual, more accurate. There's this little feature that I find useful. When you click on the Google search, the, the, the G button, um, an icon, you'll see that uh, it's, it's going to highlight in green the stuff for which it found relevant searches on Google search, meaning that, OK, this seems to be accurate information that is generated, and it's not something that's been uh, invented, you know. And if there were stuff that, uh, some aspects that are not factual, it would be highlighted in yellow or red, I think, uh, yeah, yellow or red. Um, and you can also see uh, related quer queries and such, okay? Um, and there's a question, what happens if you ask if, uh, when Felicet went on the, uh, what happens if you ask it when Felicet went to the moon, when she went to the moon? Um, yeah, basically, I mean, uh, as you can see, um, or, or or maybe I, I could add a question like, um, uh, did Felicet go to the moon? Go to the moon? And uh, it should answer with uh, no. But maybe it'll mention that uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, not Louis Armstrong, Neil Armstrong went on the moon. Sometimes it mentioned that. But yeah, so Felicia didn't go on the moon, etc. So yeah, that's uh, important to remember that um, hallucination exists. So you have to think about it as you integrate LLMs. Um, I think, yeah, there's another thing uh, I want to mention. Yeah, the, maybe I'll come back to, uh, or I'll show you the another, um, another thing before. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, I wanted to show you a structured, uh, yeah, can get rid of that, data prompts or a few shot prompts. So for example, um, if you want to help the LLM, you can also um, help it with a few examples. That's called few shot prompting, few shot prompting uh, which is about um, give some examples and example outputs. Uh, so you, you, you give a few pairs like this. And then it's going to try to answer the same way um, uh, as the examples you're, you're giving it. So for example, um, let's say uh, suggest a recipe 
with uh, the following ingredients. For example, I'm going to say uh, uh, with a pumpkin, uh, maybe I'm going to do, a, I don't know, a pumpkin, pumpkin soup. With a banana, uh, I could do a banana bread. Well, it's not the best example because uh, if you ask, uh, suggest a recipe with uh, some fruit or vegetable, it will probably answer correctly. But uh, it's just to illustrate the fact that you can give it inputs and outputs as examples so that it answers in the same way. Uh, maybe um, potatoes. Uh, is there an E? I never remember. But are those uh, French fries? And then I can give it a, an example uh, with apple. And what is it going to suggest? Okay, it's going to suggest apple pie. Well, so maybe with that example, it, it would have suggested the same thing. But it's just to illustrate the fact that with few shot prompting, uh, you can guide uh, the, the answers uh, of the model. Uh, another thing I could show you, so this time, just to show you the different interfaces that exist when you interact with the Palm API, when you're in the Google Cloud Console, you can also, um, yeah, that's not the example I wanted to show, but I think it's a good one, actually. Um, you can use um, defined prompts as well in the, the Google Cloud Console um, to uh, fine-tune your prompts, etc., before inter integrating them uh, in your application. So uh, a large language model is able to do lots of uh, interesting things. So for example, um, doing entity extraction or concepts, uh, et cetera, uh, to find the, the key keywords in a document, et cetera. Uh, you can do that and you can also guide it to generate or, or give you some answers that are really structured, like uh, returning a JSON document. So, um, so that's not the example I wanted to start with, but I, since it's there, I will show you how to extract um, uh, entities out of text. So I, I wanted to use my biography on my blog, on the gilaforge.dev, and inject that here. So I've got a prompt that says, OK, extract the entities, return a JSON array of strings, return the JSON uh, content without any markdown, because it usually answers in a, in a markdown format. And then uh, I say JSON, and I wanted to um, uh, put the JSON document after that. So let's see, what is it going to answer? Yeah, so it's able to extract various things like uh, me, uh, the company I work for, a book that I wrote, uh, companies I worked for, etc. Uh, the the other example I had in mind that I wanted to show you actually was, um, so I think I have it uh, there. Oops. Uh, so what was the name? Uh, yeah, this one. I'm going to copy the prompt here. I want it to do, uh, OK, this example. So it's a slightly different. I wanted to show you um, how, how you can, um, OK, I'm going to tweak it a little bit. Uh, I, I want to extract uh, an object that corresponds uh, to uh, the uh, a person the person's details that are represented in a biography. So for example, OK, I've got this biography, and I want to extract name, person, job, company, nationality, etc. And I want to get, again, uh, some JSON content. So here's the biography. That's my biography. And let's see if it's able to uh, extract a, a bigger structure. And indeed, it extracted my name, my role, the company I work for, or my nationality. So. What I like about this kind of example is that it illustrates the fact um, that you're able to, um, I mean, nowadays, if you look at the data that's available online, maybe 80, uh, I think it, I read somewhere that 20% of the data that's available online, uh, reachable to by, by computers, basically, 20% uh, is structured data in databases and spreadsheets and such. But 80% of the data that we have is actually just text in documents, in PDF files, in web pages. And uh, with large language models, developers nowadays, not just data scientists, but developers can extract meaningful information, structured information out of freeform uh, data. Um, what else I have to say? Yeah, I think that's about it. So as you can see, you can uh, also call the API from um, uh, 
Europe, for example, or from the US, etc. So when you use the cloud version, you have access to, uh, if you want to stay within Europe, you can you know, choose different regions um, that, that are available. And then what I didn't show you as well, uh, there are lots of parameters that you can tweak potentially um, to um, uh, decide, for example, with the temperature, if you want to have a response that is more creative uh, or which is more um, sometimes more factual or more predictable in terms of uh, output. And uh, yeah, Andres was mentioning that uh, good for recruiters to structure information from resumes. And indeed, uh, recruiters can extract meaningful information from resumes or um, when you've got job, uh, job postings, etc., you can also extract uh, key information out of text. Yeah. Um, all right, so next I want to show you, so I showed the Palm API, the various interfaces that are at your disposal to uh, create your prompts and such. Uh, now I want to show you some uh, uh, concrete integration of the Palm API in a, in a Java application. So that's the stuff that I showed you in case uh, it wouldn't work. Um, so the thing is, as I mentioned in, in introduction, I'm a Java developer. But if you look at everything that's available nowadays, it's usually mostly Python because data scientists who have worked uh, to develop large language models are usually uh, Python developers and they, they have really great frameworks for, for them uh, to do that. But I'm a Java developer, so what can I do? Um, well, nowadays uh, you can do lots of interesting things and I don't have anything against Python developers, but I'm a Java developer. OK, so let's have a look at a, a first uh, demo that I built a, a few months ago. Um, where is it? Uh, it's uh, somewhere here. Yeah. So it's a little uh, application that I've um, created, that I've written using the Micronaut framework. Uh, it's a really nice uh, framework, a modern framework that works well um, and starts super rapidly and so on, super effective framework. Uh, well, in, in this first demo, I used uh, Apache Groovy. Why I used Groovy? Because I'm the co-founder of the Groovy programming language. Uh, but you know, in, in Java, that would be just the same. And my other examples and demos will be in Java anyway. Um, I containerized my application um, you know, in a Docker container. And I deployed it as a container on Google Cloud Run. Cloud Run is a platform for um, fully managed platform for storing, uh, for um, scaling uh, and uh, hosting uh, applications. Uh, that's part of Google Cloud. And it can scale to zero, to, uh, and, and to infinity, pretty much. Um, and um, it's a great platform. Just deploy a container, and the infrastructure will be handled for you. So it's a serverless solution, if you will. Um, so this little application is doing um, is going to actually generate uh, kid stories. So there are three parameters. You can choose a, a character. You can choose a setting like when or where the action takes place, and you can also give it a, a plot like like a rough idea of what's going to happen in your story. So there are. So I created a few examples that you can pick from, but you can also there's a free form. Uh, uh, text area that you can um, that you can fit it with with anything. So uh, at first I had a few ideas, but uh, um, I didn't have that many ideas of characters, etc. So I actually used Bard to g generate other ideas. So the first few ones are mine, and the other ones are um, AI generated, basically. So let's say um, I want a story with a general dragon with a colorful skin, but I can also uh, customize this. A gentle dragon attending the Jekon conference, maybe. Uh, attending the Jekon conference with a colorful skin. Uh, a dragon in a big bustling city why not? in Germany, why not? And what's going to happen? Um, uh, let's see. Um, Solving the mystery of a haunted house. Uh, we can. What could we add? We add there um, the mystery of a haunted house, uh, full of Java developers. I don't know why not. And it's going to. I'm going to click the the button, and it's going to generate a story. So the longer um, the story, uh, the the longer the, the 
longer it takes to generate because I, I, I structured my prompt so that it generates a long story. <coughs> so usually it takes about 15 seconds or so to generate a story. Uh, 15 to 20 seconds. So let's see. All right, once upon a time in a big bustling city in Germany, there was a gem dragon named Spark who uh, loved to attend the Jekon conference. Uh, okay, it's got a colorful skin. It mentions again the, Je the Jekon conference. And uh, well, I, I won't read the whole story, but as you can see, uh, Spark, and there was a ghost at the conference. Um, there were protesters. I'm not sure what, what's going on in this story. But yeah, it was able to generate a story. And um, yeah, the, the ghost and spark, the, the dragon uh, became friends and everything. So I used generative AI to actually generate a story, right? So uh, it's not a very serious uh, example. But let me show you how I implemented that application. Uh, so this is, yeah, this application. Uh, so, as I said, I used the Micronaut framework. I have a controller, that's my story maker controller. Um, so, there's an HTML page, some JavaScript uh, that uh, picks the, um, the text area content and that sends that to my uh, API uh, controller, my Micronaut controller. So, the, the JavaScript front end is going to call, to call slash story slash generate to generate the, the story. And um, so I'm fetching some uh, data uh, like where uh, and how I'm, I'm going to call the Palm API. I also have a, I'm going to uh, put that full screen. Uh, I have a prompt there that suggests that, okay, you're a, a storyteller and I want you to structure the story in five logical acts. And then you generate a kid story in five acts 20 sentences per act, the protagonist, the character, the settings, where, where or what's happening, and the plot, what, where, what, what's happening, where, where it's happening. And then uh, the front end is going to call my uh, uh, make story method. And uh, what's going on here? So I didn't have, uh, at the time, a few months ago, there was no uh, Java API that I could use. So I used Micronaut and its HTTP client to do that for me. So I used the Java API though for uh, authenticating to the, the Google Cloud uh, platform. So I get a, a, a token, a bearer token. And then I'm going to craft the URL that point to my Google Cloud project, the region I'm in, the model, the LLM model I want to use. I'm going to, I'm going to call the predict method. And then the data that I pass is here. So I pass a prompt made of the character, the setting, the plot, and some parameters like how creative I want the story to be and how many tokens I want it to generate. And then, okay, it's a, some JSON payload uh, in and out. And I also pass the bearer token. And I'm using marshalling and marshalling built in uh, in the Micronaut framework uh, to create the call and to retrieve the output. And the output is marshal to uh, this uh, prediction response, <coughs> sorry. So it can give me a list of predictions. Uh, I'm usually interested in just one prediction, but it can generate different uh, stories at the same time. And the prediction is made of safety attributes. For example, if you want to filter, um, you know, if someone wants to hijack the, the, the application to generate weird stuff or harmful content, uh, you can check if it's blocked or not because it's harmful. And um, uh, and and uh, the content is returned in that uh, field there. So with the uh, the content, if it's not blocked, I'm going to return that to the front end and display that display that on screen. So it's fairly trivial to use the API, um, even when uh, back in the day there was no Java API. All right. So that's the first uh, concrete demo, and um, a few weeks later, when I did that application, I actually noticed that the Vertex AI SDK added a, a Java endpoint or a Java class to do the predictions to call the Palm API. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to have a look at that. But when I looked at the API, uh, I have an example. Where is it? Uh, I think it's yeah, in this example here. When you use uh, 
simple LLM call. Um, when you use the, um, the, the Java SDK, so we're, we're going to actually work on a better uh, SDK, but uh, what was available was this. Um, so you had to use protocol buffers uh, everywhere. And there was no way to actually do code completion like prediction dot content dot blah, blah, blah. And I had to use um, protocol buffers related classes like value, uh, merging, um, builders of protocol buffers. And when I get the response, I don't get a prediction class, safety attributes, string content, etc. But I get a, a protocol buffer object. So I get, so it's a list, I get the first elements, then, oh, it's a structure, it's an object. Then I, I retrieve the field, the, the content field out of that struct, then the string value. So all I wanted to do is response, uh, get the first item dot content, but it wasn't available. So it wasn't really, really nice. And that's actually when I discovered the Longchain4j project. And Longchain4j, uh, it's actually inspired by the Longchain project for Python developers. Uh, but it's been uh, re-implemented uh, in Java. So it's an open source project. Uh, it's hosted on, on GitHub. And what it's doing is that uh, it's, uh, it's actually an orchestration framework for la large language models and other related tools. So you can interact with vector stores if you want to do semantic search uh, via embeddings. You can um, handle your prompts. You can access different models, parse the output, but you can also load documents, uh, split text, uh, etc., so that you can create chunks and then do comparison over vector embeddings, which are um, vector representations of uh, tokens and sentences and so on. So I started to look at uh, Longchain4j, and I built a new application with Longchain4j. Uh, as I said, I'm the co-founder of the Apache Groovy project, and I wanted to do a, a chatbot to chat with the uh, Apache Groovy documentation. So uh, I'm going to tell you how it, well, I'm going to show you the demo first and then I'm going to tell you how it works. Uh, oh, by the way, the, the code um, of my, my demos is available on GitHub. So I am G Laforge, and then you'll find the repositories uh, there. So let's say I've got this application. Again, a Micronaut application built in Java, deployed, uh, containerized with Docker and deployed on Cloud Run because that's uh, the best platform that I know for that. So I fed my chatbot with the, the Groovy documentation. And the do uh, I think I have it there. Uh, the Groovy documentation is really tons and tons of pages long, hundreds of pages long, OK? So I, uh, I told the, the uh, I'll show you how it works. But uh, let's say, uh, can you uh, implement interfaces in Groovy? Let's see. What is it going to reply? Uh, OK, yes, you can uh, implement interfaces. So here, an example. And uh, here's yeah, custom uh, runnable, et cetera. So it's just like in Java, but uh, you, you get the idea. Um, um, yeah, what, uh, yeah, I don't have many ideas of things. Uh, can you also implement, can you implement implement records and uh, it should tell me also that records yeah you can do records so here's a, an example of record etc so how i build that application so i'm using a pattern called retrieval augmented generation for that so i take the documentation of the project the, the groovy project i split that into small chunks of text then I'm going to use the Pound API um, embedding endpoint, which allows to create vector representations of sentences and queries and text, et cetera, uh, in the form of a vector of floating point numbers. So this is a, a better way for neural, uh, neural networks to actually understand uh, text rather than using real text, you know, because it's able to do calculations with matrices and so on. So I'm going to create vector embeddings for each uh, chunks of the documentation. And I'm going to store those uh, vectors along with the, the text in a vector database. Then, so that's the first part. That's the ingestion part. 
Then later on, uh, I've got a user that comes that's going to create a, a prompt, a query like, hey, how do you implement a record or an, inter an interface in Groovy? I'm going to, again, calculate a vector embedding, but for that query. So I've got a new vector, but I'll be able to compare that vector with all the vectors that are stored in the vector database. And the thing is that vector embeddings are close to each other if they are semantically, semantically close as well. So uh, even if it's not exactly the, the same words, you know, so it's not an edit distance between words and sentences, uh, it works with synonyms and, and so on. But two vectors are closer if they are semantically uh, linked or they have this, the same meaning, basically. So what I'm doing here is that I'm actually going to compare the vector of the query with all the vectors that are stored in the vector database. And I'm going to find the closest vectors. So I'm doing an approximate nearest neighbor search in the vector database. And I'm going to use Palm again. This time, I'm going to um, provide the context. A, hey, your large language model, you know about the Groovy language, etc. I'm going to give it a, in the prompt, I'm going to tell it, OK, the user asked me the following question. Please base your answer uh, on the relevant documents that I found in the vector database, because the, the, the vectors were close to the query vector. So I'm going to feed that to the large language model, and it will try to answer to the best of its knowledge using the context that I've, uh, that I've given it with the chunks of text that are the most relevant to the query. And let me show you the code, uh, oops, uh, how it works. Uh, so that should be uh, this one. Uh, no, that's not this, this project. That's, <coughs> that's this project here. So again, Micronaut application developed in Java. So I've got a container, and I deploy that. I've got uh, my controller. So my controller is going to reply to slash query. The front end is going to hit that uh, endpoint. And I'm going to return um, fr from my uh, LLM query service. So I'm going to use this uh, method there. And this one is using uh, Longchain4j. So what's going to happen is that uh, I'm going to handle, um, so I'm going to create a, uh, first things first, I'm going to create a converse, conversational retrieval chain, which will combine several things together. I'm going to combine a chat language model, the Palm chat language model to handle the, the chat interaction. I'm going to use a chat memory uh, object to handle the, um, the memory, so if I have several users at the same time, uh, I have distinct conversations with different users. So I'm using a, a memory, uh, an exchange of uh, questions and answers per user. And I've got a prompt. And the prompt uh, is defined earlier here. Uh, so you're an expert in Groovy. You're knowledgeable as well in Java, but please answer in Groovy. Uh, you're good at ex explaining stuff. Uh, I've got a question here, and please base your answer exclusively on the, the snippets that I feed in, in the prompt, OK? And then to finish my conversational retrieval chain, I also pass a retriever. So the retriever is what is going to search the vector database with uh, an embedding model. So there are two things. And here I'm using just an in-memory vector uh, database, which is part of Longchain 4 j So that's great for, for demos. And I'm using the embedding model. And the embedding model is defined here. So this is how you point at um, a, a model. So OK, Vertex AI embedding model, uh, the location, the model that I want to use, retries. And for the chat model, I want to give the temperature, number of retries, et cetera. And out of this uh, chain, I'm going to call execute. I uh, pass the query. It's going to fit that in the prompt. And then um, it's going to uh, give me answers based on the snippets of text that are retrieved from the vector database. So really, in just a few lines of code, you're able to define um, LLM integrations that are uh, you know, non-trivial, I would say. 
Uh, yeah, so that's about it. Then there are other things like uh, rendering markdown in HTML and so on, but that's beyond the uh, uh, what we're <clears throat> interested in. All right, so that's about it for uh, my demos. Um, so using the Palm 2 uh, API uh, is pretty straightforward. Even when you're using the REST JSON API directly with your favorite framework of choice, um, but you can also use it from Java, and especially I would say with Longchain for J, it's really a, really nice to uh, to use. Um, and uh, well, I usually deploy my apps on Cloud Run because it's easy to deploy and scale containerized apps. Uh, but I'd like to give you so if you really want to dive deeper in Longchain for J, I, I, I wish I had a bit more time to to do that. Uh, but I, I would highly encourage you to look at this presentation that was recorded at DevOps Belgium. There's uh, Liz Rest who uh, covers uh, Longchain for J in in deep uh, in details, and that's uh, really nice to see all the things you you can do with the, with the Longchain for J uh, project. So there are many things I'd like to improve uh, in my uh, demos. So I'd like to make it even more factual, etc., to improve the quality of responses. Uh, but uh, there are other ideas uh, that I have in mind of projects that I like to do with large language models, like uh, news curation and that kind of stuff. And uh, feel free to uh, uh, reach out to me to talk about your, your ideas of or, or how you would like to use large language models. Uh, one last thing is um, we have a re some resources uh, on the, the Google Cloud uh, website about generative AI. So I encourage you to scan this uh, QR code or go to goo.go slash generative AI. You can join the Google Cloud Innovators Program and have access to um, material, training course, uh, cloud credits, um, et cetera, if you want to get up to speed with generative AI uh, on Google Cloud. So um, that's about it. Um, thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer them. OK, perfect. Thank you so, so much for you. your um, for your presentation and for giving us all these insights and for being here today. Um, there is a question in the chat right now. Um, right. Maybe if you have all a right. bit more time, uh, want to answer it now. I always wondered what is exactly a token. I mean, how is it related to Word? I know I can ask Bob <laughs> for that <laughs> or Google, uh, but since we are here, yeah. So a token, so it's a, usually it can be a word or it can be a piece of word, but um, if, maybe you, you were familiar with stemming how uh, we, we used to search, um, key, do keyword searching and so on. Uh, regardless of things like how verbs are conjugated, etc. So you've got the, um, it, it, in my mind, it's a bit similar to what we were doing when we were doing stemming. So it's really getting the, um, the, the roots of the words and how the, the words are, you know, composed of different uh, aspects so that uh, it's the, the generative AI large language models are able to generate tokens and when you compose the tokens, it actually create words. So even if I say, uh, uh, I love uh, strawberries, but if you say, uh, she loves strawberries, uh, the, the token would be love, but there's also an extra token that would be the extra S that you add in order to properly uh, create uh, good sounding and gra grammatically correct English, French, German, wh wh whatever language. So tokens are usually smaller than words because of that, so that it's able to create a, a, a full-blown correct sentence, uh, basically. So that, that that's why large language models usually work with uh, tokens. Mm -hmm.